Hello and welcome to Ski Lodge. My family and I are on a mission to visit and document 100 Colorado communities, and this month we went to Colorado Springs. In today's video, I'll explain what we learned about its history and geography, as well as show you what we found and what to expect if you go there. Let's get started. The history of Colorado Springs is well documented. I'll try to keep it brief, but I found a lot of information. The area was initially inhabited by the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho tribes who often gathered at the Garden of the Gods near the base of Pikes Peak, usually during winter. The landscape is in the Pinyon Juniper Zone, which is not only warmer than lower elevations, but also provides cover and resources. With the arrival of the Spanish in the 1540s, the area became the northern extreme of the Spanish Empire until the French claimed the Mississippi River system in 1673. There was a debate of ownership until 1800 when the land was officially signed over to France, who then sold it to America three years later as Louisiana. Sebulon Pike was the first American to explore the Colorado area in 1806. He followed the Arkansas River west, first seeing Pike's Peak near Los Animas. When they set up camp in the Pueblo area, he deviated from this path following Fountain Creek north, hoping to summit the mountain he'd been seeing for days. Near modern-day Fountain, he left the creek and began his ascent, hiking up what he thought was Pike's Peak. Unfortunately, he was blinded by the hills and ended up on Mount Rosa instead. Having already embarked on an unplanned journey, he cut his losses and returned to camp. Though unsuccessful, it still counts as America's first recorded alpine summit. Pike and his team passed through the metro area one last time through Cripple Creek on their way to South Park nearly a month later. The mountains of the Front Range can be seen from a distance and were used as a travel reference between the Santa Fe and Oregon trails in the 1820s and 30s. Though the Santa Fe had been bringing people into Colorado since 1821, the Pikes Peak region remained relatively untouched until the Colorado Gold Rush in 1858. Prospectors began scouring the hills for valuable minerals, and in 1859, at the mouth of Ute Pass, Colorado City was built to supply them. That winter, the Utes returned only to find their forests destroyed and their land inhabited. This started years of conflict that wasn't resolved until 1867 when the Medicine Lodge Treaty removed the natives to Oklahoma and Utah. In 1869, General William Palmer fell in love with the scenery while passing through. He purchased some land near the confluence of Fountain and Monument Creeks and started the Colorado Springs Company. Already an upcoming rail baron with the Denver Rio Grande, he put a stop in Colorado Springs in 1871, bypassing Colorado City. He named the stop Fountain Colony, but this bland name was replaced by Little London before officially becoming Colorado Springs. Palmer created this new community as a resort using the enticing scenery, nearby mineral springs, and plentiful sunshine to attract guests. He designed the town with wide streets, parks, lavish European-styled buildings, and even brought in more than 10,000 trees to complete his vision. And it worked. Colorado Springs spent the 1880s becoming a travel destination, drawing in some of the world's most famous people. Then in 1890, on the other side of Pikes Peak, Cripple Creek began its gold boom which exploded the population. A majority of the gold investors lived in Colorado Springs, leading it to be called the City of Millionaires prior to World War I. Spencer Penrose is likely the most prominent of these investors, being credited with establishing the town of Penrose, as well as amenities like the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo, Broadmoor Hotel, and Pikes Peak Highway. Additional growth in the 1890s brought the Colorado College, the county library and courthouse, and a trolley system. Nikola Tesla lived near Memorial Park at the turn of the century, and Catherine Lee Bates wrote America the Beautiful in 1893 after a trip there. The Cripple Creek strike of 1903 briefly slowed things down, but at this point Springs was relatively self-sufficient, even adding to the city over the years. In 1909, the Garden of the Gods, Cave of the Winds, and Seven Falls all became protected parks. The area remained successful despite Cripple Creek's dramatic decline following World War I. Colorado City merged with Springs in 1917, and Alexander Airport was opened in 1919. This provided even more access to the area, and growth occurred even during the Great Depression. When America started entering World War II, Colorado's inland location was ideal for U.S. intelligence, and several government facilities began popping up across the state. Camp Carson was El Paso County's first in 1941, and was followed by Ent Air Force Base, the Air Force Academy, and NORAD. Following the war, the city experienced suburban expansion when military retirees decided to stay. In addition to housing, higher education expanded with UCCS, PPCC, and CTU all opening between 1965 and 67. It was also during the 60s that Springs finally overtook Pueblo as Colorado's second largest city. The 80s saw many changes, including geographic expansion that extended the city boundaries to Black Forest and Fountain. Falcon Air Force Base was constructed to the east, and a religious following arrived with the New Life Church and Focus on the Family. 
The population of the Front Range exploded during the 90s, and by 2000, the Springs Metro had around half a million people. Despite the city's current reluctance with marijuana, Springs was the location of the state's first medicinal dispensary in 2006. The following year, the Cosmics Project began, widening I-25 from the World Arena to Monument. The city has experienced growth year after year, but has also gone through several unfortunate events recently. In 2012, the Waldo Canyon Fire burned over 18,000 acres in the Ute Pass area. Then, the following year was the Black Forest Fire, and though this burned less area, more structures were lost. Between both fires, a total of 857 homes were destroyed, plus the damage to the landscape which is still only in the early stages of recovery. In 2015, three people were killed during the Planned Parenthood shooting. 2018 saw the worst hailstorms in recorded history that caused over a billion dollars in damage. In 2020, Gannon Stock was killed by his stepmom in Lorson Ranch, and his body was found in Florida. Finally, in 2021, the boyfriend of a guest attended a child's birthday party where he killed nearly the entire family before turning the gun on himself. Despite these crazy events, though, Colorado Springs maintains a great atmosphere and enjoys lower crime rates than Denver or Pueblo. Today, the city has a metro population of 800,000, with over 5.2 million visitors annually. There are 45,000 active-duty military and 200,000 retired vets residing there, plus thousands of civilians moving in. Prices will continue to rise, especially on the north and west sides of town where expansion is impossible. Colorado Springs continues to rank as the nation's top location to move to or visit, indicating a busy future for the state's fastest-growing city. Colorado Springs is the largest city and area in the state and has the second largest population. It's at an official elevation of 6,035 feet, but varies from 8,000 to 5,500 depending on which side of town you're in. Situated five miles east of Ute Pass at the confluence of Fountain and Monument Creeks, Colorado Springs has an ideal location close to the state's most important places. Pikes Peak and the Front Range Mountains form the western edge of town, visible from every part of the metro. I-25 runs north-south, getting you to Denver in only an hour, and even less metro-to-metro. -metro. Pueblo and US-50 are 35 minutes south. US-24 runs east-west, getting to Woodland Park in 30 minutes and Cripple Creek in an hour. Colorado 115 leaves southwest and reaches Penrose and Florence in 40 minutes, and Canyon City and the Royal Gorge in about an hour. Central Springs and most of the main roads are on a north-south grid that adjusts to the hilly landscape. Newer communities tend to deviate from this pattern. The Pikes Peak Highway and most of the area's natural wonders are accessed using US-24 in or just past Manitou Springs. Other highways in the area include Colorado 83, 94, 21, and the old US 8587. Despite all these arteries, the city still lacks efficient east-west corridors. Notable communities in the Springs Metro, clockwise from the north, are Monument, Black Forest, Falcon, Peyton, Security Widefield, Fountain, Manitou Springs, Woodland Park, and Cripple Creek. With the steep mountains to the west and the Palmer Divide to the north, the area gets lower temperatures and higher precipitation than anywhere else along the Front Range. Readings from the airport show an average of 18 inches annually with 57 inches of snow, but these numbers rise as you increase elevation. Summer experiences a monsoon season lasting from June to August that brings weekly, sometimes daily, thunderstorms. The steep face of the mountains can cause updrafts that create exceptionally large hailstones. These events are rare, but can be expected every few years. Daytime highs rise to the upper 80s and then drop into the 50s overnight. Recently, droughts and dry weather have led to water restrictions and high fire danger. Spring and fall are generally comfortable with highs in the 60s and 70s. The leaves change mid-October and I'd recommend taking a drive into the mountains if you're around for it. Winter stays tolerable thanks to the city's location in the Pinion Juniper Zone, an ecological sweet spot for mild temperatures. A January day will likely see 40 degrees or more, then fall into the teens overnight. Snow falls much more often and also heavier on the north and west sides of town, but melts fast in direct sunlight throughout. Due to the city's incredible size, the weather can be quite different from one side to the other. We arrived in Colorado Springs after a fast 50-minute drive from Pueblo West, parking downtown on Vermeo near the U.S. Olympic Museum. As much as we generally try to avoid paying for parking, it was just more convenient to feed the meter as it allowed us to buy four hours at a time. The museum we were in front of is fantastic and sits at the western edge of downtown between America the Beautiful Park and the Skyline. There's plenty of space for events and everything was new and welcoming. From here I planned out a horseshoe around the major attractions. Immediately north of the museum is the old Colorado Springs train depot which today is filled with shops and restaurants. It's directly across the street from the Antlers Hotel and Park, one of the city's most iconic buildings. 
A block farther, you'll find the trail to Monument Valley Park. We turned onto Bijou and then Tejon, which I'd say is the heart of the city. Historic buildings line the street with plenty of parking and things to do. We popped into Einstein Bagels to use a bathroom and grab a bite, which was a couple dollars overpriced, but still delicious. The architecture of downtown Colorado Springs consists of old Victorians and newer brick buildings. Though seen here and there, Springs has less modern-styled buildings than equivalent places, likely an effort to match with the city's natural landscape. We passed by Cowboys, one of the area's most popular clubs, and across the street we saw several people going in and out of Blondie's. Even during the day, Springs was filled with an assortment of people from families to businessmen to tourists like us. We crossed Pikes Peak Avenue, a very recognizable street with statues on most corners and a view of the Antlers Hotel. We had entered the main business district where the city's highest buildings can be found, as well as the Pioneers Museum, Police Station, and Courthouse. We checked out the museum, which is free admission, and inside there was a few neat displays including an original courtroom and a 150-year commemorative to the city's creation. From there we went north on Nevada Avenue, which is probably the busiest street downtown. It's wide and loud and filled with parking garages. It's not the best street to see as a visitor, and it's also where we saw the most homeless. But as we kept walking closer to Acacia Park, things reappeared. Acacia Park itself is surrounded by small businesses and things to do, and would probably be the focal point for an out-of-towner. It had plenty of trees and nearby parking, plus a great view of Pikes Peak looking west down Bijou. We then went east to Weber, which we took south of Vermeo and back to the car. Weber is almost the eastern edge of downtown and had very little in the way of shops and things to do, mostly consisting of local services. Beyond Weber and Wasatch is just housing. We got back to the car and drank some water, then walked over the Park Union Bridge to America the Beautiful Park to let the kids play on the playground. The bridge is accessible from the Olympic Museum grounds and looks really cool with futuristic styling. It crosses several train tracks still in use today and has a spectacular view of the area including the downtown skyline, Drake Power Plant, and Pikes Peak. The park itself is almost brand new and is huge, spanning several acres. A large grassy area is flanked by sculptures and trees make up the edges. A pavilion with tables was next to that, followed by a large playground with different kinds of equipment. The kids really enjoyed this park and is probably the best yet for overall size and quality. Three drawbacks, the trees are still young and short, so no shade. The location is far from housing, and dozens of people were living in their vehicles on the road next to it. Despite this, we were left alone and had fun, plus it's a closer walk than Monument Valley, downtown's other park. After burning up the rest of our energy, we crossed the bridge back to the car and made our way home. Colorado Springs is a city forged by nature. Its amazing landscape inspired its history, from the Sun Mountain Utes to the eager prospectors of the Victorian age and beyond. It's a city of diversity where everyone can find something they enjoy. Having not properly walked the downtown area in a decade, we found it to be quiet, clean, and enticing. The options available to us meant everyone in the group had fun, and we were able to eat some delicious food while at it. But we must talk about the cons to get the full picture. In regards to only walking around downtown, it's incredibly small. Only a few blocks of Central Springs is worth walking by foot, and once you get past this, it's housing and commercial space not relevant to visitors. Most of the area's attractions are to the west, near Manitou Springs, which makes downtown highly local and slightly boring. Plus, whether living here or not, a vehicle is necessary, and heads up, getting around town is confusing with no good east-west roads. Everything is also far apart from each other. Taking these opinions and experiences into account, here's where we've ranked Colorado Springs so far. We hope you enjoyed exploring Colorado Springs with us and that you join us next month when we visit Colorado's third largest city, Denver's largest suburb, and my own hometown. We'll see you next time in Aurora, Colorado.